In the mid-1970s, a series of brutal killings were committed in California. While there were only a handful of confirmed cases, it is theorized that there were more than 20 victims. The case remains unsolved, though there are developments as recent as 2022. Today, we dive into the morbid case of the doodler. This is Red Web. Welcome back, Task Force, to another Monday. This is Red Web. I'm Trevor Collins, and with me is Alfredo Diaz. Fredo, we are experiencing another morbid story yep. in the realms of San Francisco Yep. here in the 1970s. Back in my hometown, the Yay area, you know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah. The hyphy movement. Sorry, I'm just taking no, it back. No, please. To, you know, look, look, there's yeah, a yeah, side yeah. of my it out. You guys don't know. But yes, yeah, back in... Uh, Wait back a minute, in the, I thought I knew everything about you. Nah. Nah, I nah, can't. nah, nah, nah. Depends. Depends what the settings is. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, you know, feel me? Like, right now I'm on the podcast. So, hello, hi. How's it going? How are you doing? You know? It's like he's talking to a mom right now. <laughs> hello. Yes, I am dating your daughter. Yeah. Your customer service. <laughs> um, but okay. Yeah, this is the Bay Area. Uh, I, I'll be honest. Mm-hmm. You're, you're, you know, introing this episode. Sure. And I was following along and, um, I, not uh, that everything was wiped from memory when you when gave I dropped me the name the name yeah the doodler the doodler. So here's the thing: this is a very serious case with a very goofy cartoonish name. So weird. And there's a reason for the name being the doodler that we'll get into. Uh, but we're gonna break this one down because, as I mentioned, there are revelations as recent as as at, at least the recording of this episode two months ago. Oh. There are updates to this case. So this case is, despite being the heart of it being in the 70s, right. there's information that continues oh, to draw out. These are some day. of the best cases when there's like still ongoing and you're still getting drips of information. Oh, yeah. Um, the doodler. The doodler. The guy or person either draws or is a murder case. Yes. Or their victim is other men. You are factual on both of those. What I what I tell you, Christian, this man's got a gut instinct that I think Wait, at this point beyond both? the natural. Straight up. This man is supernatural. <laughs> on and both? I am now I'm pivoting the episode <laughs> to talk about him. I'll this rewrite the hook. Is freaking Take it from me the out. Top. No, but truly, yes. I also want to give a trigger warning to due to the nature of the MO here uh, to our LGBT plus listeners out there, mm-hmm. because the MO behind this killer is typically that of gay white men. Those are the victims that this person tends to go for, as well as the doodler being for, yes, drawing, to put it succinctly. Wow. Um, do a lot of these killings, I mean, I, I, you're saying you're, it's in San Francisco, right? It's in San Francisco. So mm-hmm. are a lot of the killings in the Castro district? I don't know the districts of San Francisco. I, I don't know the oh, okay. It's just somewhere you in San tell Francisco. Me. We'll yeah. name we'll, some locations and then, yeah, you yes. can tell us. The Castro district, which is like a specific district in San Francisco, is considered to be like the, one of the gay capitals of the world. Yeah. Uh huh. Um, pleasant place. I lived there for a couple of years. Fantastic. It is very possible that that is the area. We're, we're going to um, get specific. But that's, that's where, like, um, you know, uh, the gay shops, clubs, yeah. um, restaurants, that's wherever, you know what I mean? Like everyone like yeah. of any sexual preference flocks there, mm-hmm. but like that's where you go and you, you know, um, you see a high traffic of men and men, women and women, sure. combinations of every which way, single people, non-single people, et cetera. Absolutely. Everyone's just flocking over there. Um, a lot of dicks. There's a great hey, you know um, what? cookie Let shop. Let them out. There's a... Sometimes I do. Free the um, bean. <laughs> San Francisco is very free. Um, there's a great cookie shop there that makes uh, delicious cookies, but they're all in the shapes of uh, dicks. I thought you were going to say something. There's a great cookie shop, that, and they make fantastic something else. Like no, pretzels. they make fantastic <laughs> dick cookies. It's hey, all right. Great. Yeah, so you tell me, because we have some very specific areas okay. that these cases all kind of surround it. They're, they're, honestly, these Cases that we're going to outline, the confirmed victims, then we're going to go into the investigation and then kind of break down how the investigation unfolded and then move on into kind of the recent updates and the theories behind who could be behind this and maybe a little bit of why, as much as we can glean from that. But let's dive in, set the scene, January 24th of 1974. 49-year-old Gerald Cavanaugh was found lying face up on Ocean Beach in San Francisco, California. The police received a call around 1.30 a.m. that night, which said, quote, I believe there might be a dead person on the beach across from Aloha Street if you follow the street right down to the water. 
He was fully clothed and investigators found that the wounds he faced occurred before his death because Kavanaugh also had defensive wounds on his hands, essentially saying that he had held his hands up right. to stop any incoming knife slashes or what have you. That's what I was going to say. It's yeah. probably a knife, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't think that you put your hands up to try and stop a bullet. But yeah, a, a defensive wound tends to be on the palms or the open hands as if to stop an incoming Damn, attack. I was hoping you'd say like... I mean, I, I would say, like, test to see if he, if he had any scratch markings, if there's any DNA in the, in the fingernails. Right. Like that. Yeah. yeah. Usually it's the other way around where the DNA ends up under the nails if you can find yeah, somebody. Under. No, it looks like it, this one was a knife, and it stands to reason that the other victims also feature heavily a knife. And we'll, and we'll see why here later on. But uh, ultimately, when it came to Kavanaugh, he was a very private individual. He was single, so there wasn't a lot of information on his personal life available. In fact... So little was known about him at the time that his identity was not determined right away. This was just a John Doe until eventually people looked into it. Now, what's interesting here with regards to Ocean Beach is that that beach is known for a place for gay men to meet up. And so I don't know if in particular Ocean Beach is in the district that you were talking about, but this, at least in the 70s, was one of those kind of spots. Yeah, I were. mean, there's various spots, but yeah, yeah I mean, like Ocean Beach, I can mm -hmm. see people, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I know San Francisco is very LGBT mm -hmm. friendly. So that's Gerald Cavanaugh. That's the first victim here. Now, the second one I want to talk about happened six months after the first known victim of the doodler. Again, these are all known victims that are all eventually attributed to the same killer. There are other potential victims out there. But these are the ones that are confirmed. This person, the second body found, was that of Joseph J. Stevens, and that was discovered on June 25th, also 1974. There was a woman taking a walk who found his body along Spreckles Lake there in Golden Gate Park. Stevens was quickly identified because he was a local celebrity who performed comedy shows in drag. He was 27 years old at the time and was last seen performing at the Cabaret Club. Stevens had only been dead for just a few hours and police believed that he had died traveling to the beach with the killer. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Golden Gate Park is huge. Very you big. You could store thousands of bodies there. Um, there's, it's just the big stretch of a park that just spans a lot of San Francisco. Um, unfortunate, um, because like, you know, this person that did drag shows, drag shows in San Francisco are, um, just, they're a hoot. Mm -hmm. You go in, you have a good time, you're having drinks, there's great music. You have people dancing up on stage and, um, you know, you have the drag queens come out and like goof around like with the audience and everything. It's a fantastic show. So the fact that, and I've been to a handful and, and it's been a very great time. So the fact that like this was someone who was, you know, a, a drag performer, it's like, oh, mm -hmm. okay. That's very well known in the area as yeah. well. Very young. Yeah. 27 years old. Yeah. Bit of a bummer. But as you can see now, the MO is starting to develop. Yep. And uh, I think police started to identify this at the time as well. But we'll go into some of the hangups with identifying that MO and why this yeah. kind of was so hard to pinpoint at this at this time. This but was a knife victim as well? This was another knife victim, yes. Now, just a few days later, this one has a much shorter distance to the previous victim, unfortunately. July 7th, the body of Klaus Christman was found on the same beach as Kavanaugh. That was Ocean Beach. Chrisman had wife and kids, but was living separately from them at the time. Because he was found with makeup in his pocket, police believed that Chrisman was also gay and connected his murders back to Stevens. The nature of the injuries connected all three victims as well as the removal of their IDs. So at this point, yes, the knife is in play with each of the victims, yeah. as well as a very specific move to remove their identification from either their wallets, their pockets, or what have you. Mm -hmm. uh, tr to try to make it a little bit harder to identify who these folks are. Well, the scary thing right now is that this killer is gaining confidence. Right. Right? Yes. He, he had a single, the first murder that we know of, and mm -hmm. then six months later, another murder. But mm -hmm. immediately after, days later. Like like the, two weeks, kind like of. Two weeks yeah, later? something like that. Like the third. So yeah. it's ramping up. Well, you say that, but it wasn't until almost a year later that a fourth victim was confirmed to be attributed to whoever this person was. This was on May 12th of 1975, and Frederick Elmer Kappen was found behind a sand dune, again, on Ocean Beach. 
Kappen, who was 32 at the time of his death, was a Navy veteran and more easily identifiable because he was a registered nurse. And you might know your significant other is a registered mm -hmm. nurse and uh, nurses have to give their fingerprints and this helped confirm his identity at the time. Also, due to the markings in the sand around where his body was found, it is believed that his body was moved around 20 feet. Now, I don't know if that was in order to try to hide the body or what those markings were, but also markings in sand don't last very long. No. So it's a very interesting note there. But then the next victim we're going to talk about, almost like you said, he was picking up speed. Then suddenly it was like almost a year gap. And then... He has one in May, and then one just less than a month later in June. On yeah, June 4th, it feels so. it feels like he killed, took a you know took a break, mm -hmm. killed two, and then and then I was like, okay, I got to cool off again. Right, and now he's you know killed. It's kind of sporadic. Yeah, where he's just like, all right, I'm gonna kill. These are my locations, and I'm kind of just gonna take a break. And right. when I do kill, I'm gonna do like beach, mm -hmm. going to a park beach. And it's like this is his two locations that he's very comfortable with for sure. Well, I'm glad I get to pull you down off your supernatural gut check instincts pedestal because now we have a different park in play. Uh-oh. I don't know how close this one is, so tell me. Uh, so again, June 4th, the body of Harold Goldberg was found in Lincoln Park. Would that oh. be in a similar area to yeah, Golden I mean, State that's, Park? That's still in, in SF. I mean, it, you could pretty much drive like 20 minutes like in any direction in San Francisco and still it like hit like the different yeah. corners of it. That's true because like ultimately I know that but these I know, are all I mean these are all areas I've hung out in. Yeah. Like, these are all within Lincoln like a Park four mile I think radius. Yeah. It's very I it's very close. Think about it. But Goldberg was an immigrant from Sweden and was 66 years old so this person wow, was much, much older. older. Yeah exactly. Much older than the other victims. Um, his pants were found to be unzipped and his underwear was removed and it was estimated that he had been dead for upwards of two weeks when he was found. So this one, it seemed like missed being found for quite some time. So there's something different about this one, but uh, Goldberg is believed to have been the final victim of the supposed doodler, but police in general believe that there could be as many as 16 others. What? Yeah. So where were these bodies being put? I, I don't know. I mean, here's the thing. Like, the reason why these are all attributed is to the nature of the right. victims, uh, the way they were found, the the wounds that they had, etc. But are we saying, like, the MO could have changed up and that's why we're not, like, linking it together? It's that, but a couple of other reasons that I'll kind of get into okay. here as I talk about the investigation. But ultimately, this could address that long swath of time that the person kind of took away right. from, uh, from, from seeming to do their... Their criminal acts. Their evil ways. Yeah. But let's push forward. Let's talk about the investigation because due to the prejudice towards the gay community at the time, the Doodler murders did not get as much investigation and media coverage as they probably should have. Yeah. At this time, if you, if you know much about your history, it was still difficult for people to be out and they could be arrested or even attacked just for being out. San Francisco, as we kind of mentioned, is a very LGBT friendly area and it has been historically and that's why a lot of this activity is happening probably in this city you know whether it's hateful crimes yeah. or i mean or whatever yeah like, you still had a, a like it was a safer place but it still wasn't safe right exactly right but even then when you look at it people knew that like that was a place to go if you mm -hmm. wanted to meet other gay people yeah um yeah, so that's why the killer was targeting San Francisco. Yeah, I mean, exactly as you said, San Francisco at that time was a safe city to be in and be out, as safe as one could be, right, right? societally speaking. Yeah. But it, it wasn't perfectly safe. Uh, there was prejudice abound, even in the local police, right? It, yeah. it just, it's a fact of the matter, right? And what kind of made this all the more frustrating looking back is that this was during a time where the Zodiac killer was active, messaging the police, messaging newspapers, right. sending Taunting letters and during this window. You also have a different case that we haven't covered known as the zebra murders. Um, it was the same month that the doodler killed his first victim that the zebra killers started back up again. Maybe that's a case that we'll cover in a future episode, but you know, we, we talked about the Zodiac killer. So the fact that all of these crimes were happening focused in this area during this time window, you know, made it hard to really identify. Was this a separate person a separate crime spree or was this part of those or were these a bunch of like individual acts that all kind of got muddied in the water it's just yeah when a lot of crime is going down it can be I, hard i wonder like how confusing 
or not confusing it could be to the authorities and people investigating murder cases if you start switching up your ammo. Or if you don't yeah. have one, right? Or if you what, don't have one, if it's right? random. If it's just random, sometimes one, it's just different for every person. Sometimes you Absolutely. steal their ID. Sometimes you cut off a pinky. Sometimes a gun, a knife. Right. Et cetera. Right. It is it is interesting. You know, I mean, not that most killers or any killer would be thinking with their right mind. Yeah. But it is interesting, right? That And, and perhaps in a, in a very dark way, kind of lucky that these victims were so similar because it wasn't until deep into the investigation that police identified, okay, these are all gay white men mm-hmm. uh, who are passing away from similar injuries, right? Knife wounds. Yep. Uh, and they're all attacked. IDs and that, taken. And, exactly. Yeah. And the police kind of classified these, these particular victims uh, as victims of rage killings. And so, yes, very dark, but it is like you're saying, this person could have had a randomized MO which would make this all the more impossible to yeah. to get to the bottom of. So in a way... You almost think, too, that like it's not going to be random because it, in some sick sense of thought, a lot of ki- like serial killers, you see that they want to be like known. Yeah, like they right? want like their their like They thing, want their little their signature, signature on yeah. it. And I'm like, that's insane to me. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Now, like I mentioned, media coverage, investigation, like depth uh, was all kind of... We were, we were struggling to get that going, right, at the time. Uh, and it wasn't until six months after Goldberg's body was discovered that the San Francisco Chronicle finally covered the case on the front page. There had been murders of other gay men, so police first thought that they were dealing with multiple killers or other specific killers. Um, but after many failed leads, they realized that there must be one killer for these cases, particularly because... There were survivors, survivors that they got to know and got to talk to. And from those survivors, they gleaned more information, not only regarding the MO, but the identity of this person. Right. Okay. Interesting. Because then if the body was like an ocean beach, Golden Mm -hmm. Gate Park, uh, Lincoln Park too as well, you would think in my mind already, I was like, okay, this person is like talking, interacting, gaining trust, then going to these locations you know, with another person in order to kill them. Right. But if there's witnesses, like, I don't think he was killing and then trying to move the bodies. It's just so much work, so much spreading of evidence. Yeah. So. Seems like the, they, they got to know them, lured them into a place that would make sense, and then right? They're just. Whatever their narrative yeah. was. Yeah. I'm very interested to see how the, place, and the then, survivors, one, survived. And, right. And one information. Because to me, in my mind, they have spent. A good amount of time face to face with this person. Yeah, absolutely. So huh. let's talk about some of those failed attempts. As you can imagine, just given like we've already covered the societal pressures and everything of, of gay men at the time, these these people kind of have code names because they didn't want to be outed publicly, yeah. nor did they want to out other people. But this also will crop back up later. So I'll kind of put a pin in that. But the first known person to come forward with a failed attempt in a story was only known as the European diplomat. They had an encounter with the doodler at a bar called The Truck Stop in July of 1975. This is right when you were saying that they were picking up speed or steam or momentum mm-hmm. or what have you, like that, you know, it seemed that crimes were getting a little closer yeah. to each other. And so maybe this played a part in them taking a, a step back. So per their story, they said that the doodler approached them, the diplomat, with sketches of animals and caricatures and that the two went to the diplomat's apartment. He told the diplomat that he was actually a cartoonist, and this, as I mentioned, and as you guessed, is how he got the nickname The Doodler, because uh, the police started to believe that this is likely how he lured people in, talking about his sketches and just being open about himself and his hobby. I just... interesting. Tell me, what what would you do, you know? Well, because in my mind, I, I picture The Doodler just... In the club, mm-hmm. right in San Francisco, it's like, ns, 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 and then like walking up yeah. and like at someone like at the bar grabbing a drink. Ns, 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 ns. Hey, ns, 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 ns. <laughs> I drew this duck. You like it? Ns, ns, Here, I'll get the beats going. Hey, what's up? I drew this duck. <laughs> Want a drink? Like, like what is right? It, I don't like. How do you approach someone with like doodles and like? It's it's interesting. So I think what you do is like you know you find a club that's got the uns and you got the dances yeah. and you got the, but you got the like the booths on the side right. somewhere you can sprawl out, draw out. 
but then head to the bar. You know, or someone's getting a drink. You're, you're there. You, papers spread out. Papers spread. You're, you're trying to cop some lines. Like, oh, what are you drawing? It very easy for someone to come in and be like, oh, hey, what you drawing? It's an yeah. easy, easy icebreaker. icebreaker. Yes. Absolutely. So, I mean, I don't know. It's avant-garde to say the least, but I mean, clearly it broke the ice for, for like you put your guard people. down. You just have someone that's just like right. drawing a bunch of stuff. And you think to yourself like, oh, this person's just chill, relax and doing their own thing. Mm -hmm. I approached. Oh, that's the thought. I approached them. Right. So chances so, are they're not. If the doodler's approaching people. Yeah. That, like that. That's what he, that's what happened here. The doodler approached, right? Oh, okay. Let the guard down with the doodles. But you're right. I mean, if any of these victims came forward and it was the, the other way around, your guard yeah. is much more lowered because you feel comfortable. You're the one breaking that ice by making mm -hmm. the conversation. Hey, what are you drawing? What's going on here? Right. But yeah, so they went back to the diplomat's apartment and the doodler goes into the restroom to whatever, maybe just use the restroom, maybe collect themselves before they do a crime, what have you. But afterwards, came out of the restroom. He then attacked the diplomat by stabbing him in the back with a knife. He attempted to spin the diplomat around to, to be face to face. The knife broke and the doodler then fled. The what diplomat, are the chances? Right. The knife broke? The knife broke and the doodler booked it. Now, the diplomat, when recalling the story, remembers the doodler having said, quote, you guys are all alike. Just kind of in the scuffle of it all. And the interesting thing here is that there there wasn't there hasn't been any type of like physical or sexual contact. No, right. Yeah, so this I mean this could be you know just someone that is not fond of could people be. that are gay, you right? Know? Um, as opposed to because I was and I was waiting to see if it was someone that was gay attacking other gay people, but mm -hmm. this this I mean so far it just seems like he's just trying to lure gay men over. Right. I can't, but like. Wouldn't you know their face at that point? Well, you would, right? I mean, so so the, the trouble is now is that police have to confidently connect these failed attempts back to the original cases or the original victims yes. to provide enough tangible or, or connective tissue, right? To be mm -hmm. like, this is the person. So like, either way, they're like, okay, you know what you experienced for your potential crime, you, you know, your attack. Right. So we can note that down. Can we apply that back to these other victims? That's yet to be kind of figured out. But the confidence is building, right? The police are saying, okay, this is a similar method of attack. It seems that there is a homophobic intent here. And so they start kind of building up the idea, okay, we might have some people who survived this, this person, this attack. And so there are two more people that I want to talk about. And that will kind of help build the connection between the victims here as well as the survivors to say, yeah, same, same person. So just days later, the doodler returned to the same apartment complex on the same floor and got into another man's apartment by asking to use the telephone. This is wild to me. Hell no. Not only comes back to the diplomat's apartment, goes to the same floor, goes to some neighbor on that floor, to, and then gets into their apartment saying, hey, can I use your telephone? What? Um, he tied this man up. Also, hell no, you ain't using my phone. No, you're not using my landline. There's plenty of pay phones on the way that you walked yeah. here. You know what I mean? Take my sugar, take my butter, get an egg, and, and get the hell out. Yeah. You're not using my landline. So, he got into this man's apartment, tied him up, but thankfully, neighbors overheard everything going down as the man was screaming, asking for help, and when they came uh, to help, it turns out that the doodler had escaped prior to them being able to get there in time. So... Dude ran out it's There's a lot of fire escapes and balconies certainly and yeah so so thankfully it stopped what could have been another victim but unfortunately uh the neighbors were not able to make it in time to to catch the person in the act see who this was yeah damn it but then wouldn't that person see his face they did but again, right? How do you tie it back to everything you tie it back? else? You want to make sure that there's confidence here. But the fact is, like, I mean, we know for a fact that this this is the same person who came for both survivors. Now. Yes, I you mean, know, either that's way, fact. tie this person up, get him out of there, get him off the streets. Absolutely. Now, it seemed that the doodler repeated the same thing he said when he attacked the diplomat, right? Saying something along the lines of. Uh, all you guys are the same or all alike, right? How would he have known that that person was gay? That's a good question. I, I wouldn't... Uh, Christian, do we know? I mean, was this man out? Did he... Uh, not from... We couldn't, we couldn't find anything that, like, concretely said anything. Mm -hmm. I mean, he could have... 
knocked and then uh, you know saw that there was the pride flag or or a number of things to kind of like sure to tip your head kind of like tip your head in that direction but that's just like boy it's just random luck yeah so either way though it's it said that the person that attacked him and tied him up said similar things similar aggro lines to to basically confirm that yes this is the same person we're dealing with now the third survivor i want to talk about was actually a pretty well-known actor. They're, they were, again, anonymous, but this is a, an unknown timeline. This was sometime, at least when researching this case, it seems that it happened somewhere during the timeline of the other victims that we talked about. So the doodler went to the home of this anonymous well-known actor, and at the actor's home, a knife fell from the doodler's sleeve. How they ended up in the house, what their excuse was for being there or how they were we let in, know. we don't know, yeah. um, or at least not in, in the research that we did. But suffice to say, a knife fell from the doodler's sleeve and the actor was able to see that and book it the heck out of there. So all three survivors were able to provide a description, as you're asking for, of the doodler. And they described him as a young, probably somewhere in his early 20s, young man, African-American. He was thin with long limbs a narrow face and high cheekbones. And based on this description, police were able to produce a forensic sketch of the doodler. This drawing led to a witness actually calling the police in order to provide them with information on a man who fit the description and actually visited the Tenderloin, a club, offering to draw other patrons while carrying a butcher knife in January of 1976. So this is yet another year later, right? This is after all the confirmed victims that we talked about. It's the top of the year, 1976. This guy calls in. He goes, yo, I saw this person at this club asking to draw people, and he was also brandishing a knife. And so now we know factually this guy's out there still trying to do this. What we have a trail to follow. Hell? Well, like, but we're still in unsolved why? territory, right? Like, why? A knife? Why he's got a knife? Like, why is he in a like in like in a bar? Yeah, he's back in the bar scene, drawing people up. But with a knife out in the open? See, that's where I don't know. I just know that this person's saying they had a butcher knife. I'm, I'm sure he wasn't just openly going like, hey, who wants to get yeah. their picture drawn? But like, maybe it's like it slipped or it showed or maybe just like, I, hey, I saw him pull it out of his well, bag. Look, not that back, I like, condone what this person's doing, but like how many times is, is your knife going to just f- right. flop out? Or break or, you know, something. Yeah, you get like cheap knives and, and on top of that, they're falling off like of your of the, your person all right. the time. Like people are coming forward saying, I've seen you. I know you have a knife. I'm talking to the police right now. Now, despite the knowledge, okay, we have a drawing of this person. We have an eyewitness after all of these victims saying he's out here doing his whole MO thing right now. Like I've seen him. You should stake out this way. Despite all of that, these victims refuse to take the stand and testify, obviously because of the societal pressure oh, no. of being gay. Right, and so I get it. They but damn they, it. That's why. Right, it's tough, Seems man. Like, it really is. Like they don't want to out themselves. Uh, they don't want to publicly out other people. Yeah, it just seems like we got this person like on lock. You know what right. I mean? Right. But yeah, I mean, officers stated that they strongly believe that the man in question was responsible for the crimes. Basically, saying that these three survivors probably, almost definitely, I should say, had a run in with the same person that they had been looking for for the other victims that we talked about. But ultimately, this individual, this doodler, was never tried or convicted due to the survivor's refusal to appear in court, which, you know, just gets in the way of providing strong evidence, right? It is worth mentioning that the politician and activist Harvey Milk, uh, there's a whole film about this guy. If you don't know much about him, I've heard it's an amazing film. Uh, but he expressed empathy towards the victims who refused to speak with the police. because, he, And he actually said, quote, I understand their position. I respect the pressure society has put on them. And and in case you don't, uh, like, I don't know much about Harvey Milk, I won't pretend to know, but I know, I, uh, Christian, you can fact check me just in case, but he was a gay man out and as a politician. It was a, it was a big thing at the time. And so he, like, publicly is saying that, like, hey, I understand the pressure in place here. Like, we shouldn't vilify these guys just because they don't want to, you know, testify, right? But, uh, it's very complicated. Yeah, Harvey Milk uh, was in San Francisco. He was a member of the San Francisco Board of Supervisors, and he was the first openly gay man to be elected to public office in California. Yeah, and I think the movie Milk is all about that. But ultimately, for unknown reasons, the Doodler murders, at least as we have seen them and understand them, ended in 1975. Personally, 
I would do to it being to the fact that he knows or they know that their identity is known because there are sketches of them. Yeah. There are people telling stories of them. And, and the only thing preventing them from going to prison is these men not coming forward and telling their story. So that's my guess as to why these crimes stopped. Because remember, somebody saw somebody of this likeness and of this MO at the beginning of 1976 potentially attempting to do the same thing. So it almost seemed like maybe they gave up or maybe they just decided to move away from this or maybe they dropped their MO and, and became more random. It's hard to say, but that's all we know about the crimes at least up until we get into the recent updates. Damn. Damn. Yeah. We to had them. To get so close, right? We had them. It, it, it sucks. Hey, everybody. Trevor here, as always, with some... Uh, housekeeping notes regarding Red Web. We're doing well. Take your temperatures, everybody. Hope you're doing well as well. Um, but hey, I have some exciting news for all of you mystery macabre lovers. We have within our family of podcasts, another kind of eerie, dark, potentially sinister podcast that is launching called 30 Morbid Minutes. It's hosted by two friends of mine, Jessica Fasami and Elise Willems, and they are phenomenal, hilarious individuals, and they talk about, uh, well, if you're listening to this podcast, you're going to like it. They talk about the dark, macabre stuff throughout history all the way up to today. They talk about things like sleep paralysis demons. They talk about the Victorian era obsession with death and superstition. They talk about the history of Ouija boards. They go into all sorts of stuff that I think you're really going to like. And they also sprinkle in their own style of humor. So again, if you really like what we do on Red Web, I think you're really going to enjoy 30 Morbid Minutes. Available wherever you listen to podcasts. They just launched. So please go subscribe. Give them some support. Show them the love. They are on Rooster Teeth as, as we are. But they are also on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you listen to podcasts. They are available. So give them some love. Really appreciate those gals. With that said, I want to talk about some of today's fantastic sponsors. This episode of Red Web is sponsored by HelloFresh. With HelloFresh, you get farm fresh pre-proportioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. You can skip all those annoying trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking fun, easy, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. HelloFresh's chefs really know how to diversify the menu with seasonal recipes like salmon limon and pasta primavera, but you can pick your favorite from 50 different weekly options and skip weeks when you don't need to. Maybe you're not going to be home, maybe you're working a little bit, maybe you want to make your own stuff, whatever. You can pick your own recipes because you can park and come back to HelloFresh whenever you want. You can change your delivery dates, you can update your preferences on the app. Very easy to use. I've used HelloFresh for quite some time now. The dishes are phenomenal. They always make you feel like you're educated and know what you're doing in the kitchen because they make it really easy. But more important than that, they make them really tasty. Because they're fresh, they're they're sent right to your door. You know that you're getting good quality ingredients. And when you cook them up, by the way, they have pictures to walk you through it. When you cook it up, it always tastes phenomenal. Even me with a picky, uh, a picky little palate, I know I'm going to get something fresh, get something tasty. So go to HelloFresh.com slash RedWeb16, use code RedWeb16 for up to 16 free meals and three gifts. That's up to 16 free meals and three free gifts by going to HelloFresh.com slash RedWeb16 and use code RedWeb16. HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. This episode is also sponsored by The Jordan Harbinger Show. The Jordan Harbinger Show is absolutely worth checking out. He interviews people with fascinating stories and specialized knowledge. We're talking North Korean defectors, actual spies, even FBI interrogators. So some really juicy, hard-hitting interviews here. And the show also covers topics far beyond just those. Jordan's archives include technology stories like deepfakes, telepathy, and preventing a superbug epidemic. He's even done episodes in all kinds of experimental psych topics. Jordan's a great interviewer who's able to pull amazing insights out of his guests. And they're both entertaining and informative at the same time. It's phenomenal. Check out jordanharbinger.com slash start for some episode recommendations or search The Jordan Harbinger Show. That's H-A-R-B as in boy, I-N as in Nancy, G-E-R on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. With that said, let's get right back into the mystery. But let's talk about some of those recent updates because in 2018, the Doodler case was reopened by investigator Dan Cunningham. In 2019, an updated aged forensic drawing was released basically to say like what this drawing would look like in, in modern times, right? It's been math, 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 40 to 50 years, right? Since since this yeah, person was active. You know, 
minute. So they updated an aged forensic drawing and they released that as well as the recording of the 911 call that led to the discovery of the doodler's first victim, Kavanaugh. In reopening this, they really wanted to contact the anonymous caller that called 911, but one of the complications with this case is given the time frame, it is entirely possible that some of the survivors, anonymous witnesses, the criminal themselves could all have passed away naturally, and so we wouldn't be able to reach out to them to, to get more information. Or perhaps, you know, whoever these anonymous individuals are, they might not want to be found in the first place, right? Yeah. At this point, they've moved on with their lives. Yeah. Yeah. But in reopening this case, the police also began offering a $100,000 reward for any information regarding the doodler. $100,000. $100,000. reward. Mm-hmm. For any information. But then, January of 2022, and today I'm going to date this podcast, that was literally just two months ago, investigators discovered another possible victim of the doodler. A victim from April 27th of 1975, a man by the name of Warren Andrews, who was attacked and found unconscious at Land's End, north of Ocean Beach. Now, this person wasn't identified as another doodler victim just due to the nature of this particular crime. It's a little different. So Andrews was a 52-year-old lawyer for the U.S. Postal Service. He never regained consciousness after the initial attack and later died in the hospital. The method of this murder was much different than those prior, which led police to believe that perhaps this murder was unrelated, at least at the time, that's what they thought. Right. But looking back, they thought, well, while Andrews was injured in a different way, Cunningham, the investigator that opened the case again, believes that perhaps the doodler, due to his location, the time period, uh, etc., like maybe this was just a different way to attack them, or maybe they fumbled the knife, which seems to keep happening, and instead have might have pivoted to strangle Andrews because he lost his knife. These are just the modern assumptions of that case. But what did help kind of bring him into the MO and bring him under the idea that this might be a doodler mm -hmm. victim was the fact that it was yet another gay white man. So and it was also around this time in January of 2022 that they increased the reward for information to $200,000. Wow. Yeah. Accommodating so for inflation. It sounds like. Um, Whoa. But yeah, so uh, ultimately, and the, now this is... Yeah, because uh, he'd still be alive. Potentially, yes. Potentially, yeah. Yeah, if he was in his early 20s, in the 70s, right? Yeah. That would be, you know, late 60s now-ish. Yeah. You know, maybe maybe pushing 70. So it depends, right? I mean, like, it, like we have, we're so many episodes in, and I've just come to realize, like, there are a handful of killers that have gotten away with stuff and oh my gosh could a lot yeah. yeah there's been a, there's a lot and they're just living their lives right they right? could they could be one of those dudes in the tommy bahama shirt and on the keys that you walk by and they're just like that's exactly a, that's an overly tanned man <laughs> but no that was very descriptive no, yeah, they, you were yeah. real specific. Hey, I think we all have a memory of hitting what? the beach and there's a, there's a man in a Tommy Bahama shirt kicking it in his flops and he's, you know, he's got a little bit too much of a tan going on. Like, I think you all know what I'm bit, talking about. A little bit too much of a tan. Yeah, Christian gave me the single nod. Yeah. You know, I think that was a, yep. a nod of like, okay, whatever, move on. whatever okay, you say, Trevor. Well, saying. Just like the owls, Trevor. <laughs> <laughs> this man, okay, sunburned. Let's just put it yeah. sunburned. Um, but, but yeah, this is a scary thought. Yeah. But yeah, we're, uh, this is going to be an interesting uh, episode because, and I, and I want to be very respectful of this information because this is a reopen case task force. Don't feel the need to go jumping on this, but I do want to put it in here for posterity as with every case that is ongoing or that is uh, something that you can get involved with in some way. I ask that you proceed with respect if you have any information, but there is an anonymous tip hotline with the SFPD, that they are still seeking information. Uh, the phone number is 415-575-4444. You can also text a tip to TIP, T-I-P-411, if you have anything. There's also a Doodler podcast presented by the San Francisco Chronicle, and that's at www.thedoodlerpod.com. So, if you have any information task force, just by happenstance, if you know anything about this, or anecdotally or otherwise, that is your way to uh, to help. This person's just walking into bars, doodling, fumbling knives left and right. Right. And has attempted to kill people and has tied up people just staring at them dead in the face. Mm-hmm. 
got away with it. And got away with it. That's like that blows my I mind. I mean, with with it, like you said, there's a lot of people that have gotten away with heavy crimes like this, and it right. never gets easier to talk about. No, right? it's but just a lot always of that's so frustrating. Like, there was a murder, or you know, they were attacked in a dark alley. This person's just like meeting people at bars and then having 20, 30 hours worth of conversations face to face and and then murders or attempts to murder and still got away with it. That's pretty, uh, pretty interesting. Yeah. So moving on, let's talk about some of the theories behind this person and, and, uh, the potential motive as well as the potential identity. Now, as, as you would think that there would be some names in the theories, much like we did with the Zodiac Killer case, right. et cetera. There are no names here, so to speak. I think one of them is a factual person, but they're also going to kind of have a code name just due to the possibility that they aren't. Anyway, let's right. I'll stop burying the lead. I'll dive in. So be innocent. Yeah. So one of the theories is that this was a group of people, simply enough, that this is a group of individuals, regardless of their motive, that did these crimes. But like, I guess... A group of people that went and did these crimes individually? Whether individually or as an organized group, that would kind of well, be up for... No, in the sense of like, even if it was an organized group, uh-huh. they would go on these... Oh, yes. That it wouldn't be a group committing these right, crimes. Exactly. It would be one individual. One person yeah. at a time. Yes. These, yeah. um, so that is one theory. Um, I'm not sure with all the information I know that that would be the most likely, but it is worth mentioning. The next theory, again, doesn't specifically talk about an identity, but rather addresses the potential motivation behind why they were attacking gay white men yeah, in this neighborhood, like, what right? The hell? So this theory kind of talks about this being that the killer is a closeted gay man, right? And I do want to just another trigger warning for any LGBT members out there um, who this is some potentially heavy subject matter, right? So some believe that the doodler was a closeted gay man. They believe that he was unhappy with his homosexuality and took out his anger on other gay men. Yeah. It's it's possible, right? It's it's really hard to kind of guess either way, right? That but this is a popular theory. I mean that that is that is a thing. As, Mm -hmm. As someone who has like grown up, you know, like in the culture and has had family members and have has lived like, you know, in in the thick of in the thick of the Castro. Yeah, I've heard a lot of stories about that stuff. Mm-hmm. I mean, and, and I, again, I can't harp on it enough, right? Like the mid '70s, it was just—I mean, even even before the '70s, but right now in the moment, well, and then you felt the pressure. You felt from the pressure, like society, and so there's dem- crimes happening around your, you know, your demographic. Yeah, there is a societal pressure. Yeah, and here, just like another thought here on this on this particular theory is that a lot of people do believe that this is a little bit dismissive. And that the doodler was simply taking an advantage of these folks, right? Like of gay men in this area being underprotected by the police, being hidden and obscured by this oh, societal I hate pressure. The thought of that. I know. Yeah. Maybe that they yeah. knew that these people would not want to come forward to say something because what that would mean for them and their peers, right? Yeah, you look at it, you look at the gay community as an easier target because of the pressures and the mm. the amount of things that that community you know faced and is still facing to this very day and so it's a lot different right mm-hmm. oh man that's that's grimy as hell it's, it's very grimy and the, and the oh. thing is i don't want to try to go off the rails on this one i don't want to try to make any assumptions you know we we try to imbibe our thoughts into the show now with something like this, it is or it isn't, right? Like, yeah, yeah. I, I don't want, like, I can't speak to a lifestyle that I am unfamiliar with. And I, yeah. but, um, but either way, like, grimy. Yeah. Grimy. Either way. But that leads us to the next theory, which is, is definitely a person, but for the sake of their anonymity. Right. Um, because again, it could be I mean, someone innocent. Uh, yep. this person is referred to as the patient. Um, now, the reason why this comes up. Interesting. Code name. You'll understand why. So in 1977, there was a San Francisco psychiatrist who reported to the police that his patient confessed to the doodler killings. His patient was struggling, he says, with his homosexuality and claimed that he took his feelings out on these victims as a result. So this kind of dovetails nicely with some of what people are thinking in the previous theory, the more general theory. What year was this? This was in 1977. Ooh, 
Ooh, so that, just on the heels of damn, all of this, that right? bears more weight to it in my mind. Yeah. Because we have done a ton of episodes where people are like, look, I was on the other side of the planet, but I did these murders. And it's like, why? Right. I don't. Right. What? You, okay. Um, but this person is not only confessing to the murders, but confessing to their sexuality during a time where it was difficult to do so. And saying that that was the motivation. Yeah. That that was the pressure that drove me to, to do the crime, right? Right. And so they're, they're, they're submitting themselves to kind of like the two lanes of, of one being a murderer and two um, being gay. Yeah. And on top of that, the patient was a quiet, smart type, but most notably, they studied art. Mm. And that's something, I mean, you can't really just be like, suddenly I whip up an art degree. I mean, this person had a track record of studying art, and that provides some more possibilities here with connecting them to yeah. the doodling part of this job, especially if you're doodling in the club and you're looking for an icebreaker, if you're quiet, right? Like the, the, the like victims not have the, the ones that survive, not have like a doodle of themselves somewhere like to you, compare styles. Yeah. Cause you would think that like, if this person is like luring men in to, you know, go back to their apartment, right? Because the, you think that like if you're doodling, you might draw a little something for them or right. But I mean, I guess they don't, you know, that's just leaving evidence behind. Because yeah, that's true. Like, you, here's you my analyze, calling card, essentially. Right, exactly. As with every unsolved true crime case, the difficulty becomes the conviction. And that's the frustrating part, right? So the police didn't have enough evidence to convict the patient. It just wasn't enough to go off of. Now, which is interesting, it's kind of counter to a lot of stories you hear nowadays where a lot of true crime situations are resolved rightfully or wrongfully purely yeah. because they got someone to admit it right yep. all they need now is someone to confess and they're like got it done it. they're like close them in jail. shut case right so i don't know what that says about the due process then versus now or what have you and i'm not going to get into that but this person's coming forward they're saying that they did it Yes, they are seeing a psychiatrist. There could be, you know, other elements in play that we're right. not knowing about that could kind of Con shake like the foundations. Confidentiality. There's stuff definitely like that. that. Like yeah, but either way, or or was the uh, confession made in a in the correct state of mind? What was the nature of the confession? Mm -hmm. All of these other more complicated human factors, right? But ultimately, you know, just to cut to the chase, the police didn't have enough evidence to convict. And again, this kind of harkens back to the survivors being unwilling to testify. So even if the patient was the person, you know, you talk about, will those other folks be able to come forward and identify the doodles as the same style? No, simply, simply enough. The survivors didn't want to testify in any way. And and I understand that, right? Damn. Oh. Yeah. So the patient walks free. And, um, you know, some, including Investigator Cunningham, suspect crimes in different areas around the country to also be attributed to the doodler. Now, I don't know what that says about the patient being here in San Francisco in 1977. I don't think it obscures them uh, from any blame or anything uh, or, or frees them entirely. But if there were other potential doodler cases around the, the nation, it could draw this person's confession to question, right? Yeah, I mean, but then you can go back to one of the theories being that it was a group of people. Also, you have copycats, um, right? I mean, the MO, very simple. Um, right. It wasn't like the MO was to take out a kidney or anything like that. Not everyone can do that, right? It's it's, it's to have a knife and to draw. Mm -hmm. I mean, could have been drawing stick figures for all we know. To be clumsy with a knife yeah. and to draw. Yeah, to be really clumsy with a knife and to draw. Yeah. Have really cheap knives as well. Well, to end this on one more frustrating bombshell... No, as we do no don't you do know it. there's no. a reason why it's unsolved baby come on there's so many reasons why it's unsolved <laughs> so uh the police who reopened this case were very much hoping to identify the psychiatrist in order to talk to them to see if they could give any more information regarding their their clients uh, anything that they could tell us about the patient etc now the identity of the doctor, any information regarding who this psychiatrist was, how to find them, etc., has all been somehow lost. So there you have it. We have a what? psychiatrist who has a patient who confessed to the crime. We have a reopened case in 2018. Lost? We have so many connective elements that we could definitely look into. 
But for some reason, somehow, some way, you mean a lot of this is just lost. How do you lose the name of the doctor who had a confessing patient? I don't know. That's like on the front page of your notes on this. That's How the name of the know? case. I Dr. Whataburger. I thought you were going to say the doctor passed away. I'd be Jack. I mean, doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Buffle doctor. That's the thing. The doctor could have passed away, right? Again, coming back to the time period, it's been enough time now. Yeah. But, but, the but fact, we don't know. The fact is that we just don't know the name of the doctor. Yeah. Bada boom. Oh, man. I don't know if you like send out of like, hey, I don't even know. Like, how do you, how do you even that? start? How do you how do begin? You, where do you start? How do you even reach that person? I imagine that there was someone whose whole job it has been, probably Inspector Cunningham here, if that's his right title, uh, from 2018, is just filing, rifling through manilas, you know? Yeah. The filing cabinets open, slam, close. I just see a montage in my head, single bulb swinging above him as he's like re reading over all these redacted files, just looking for a crumb, a piece of evidence to not find out a, who the hell was this doctor. That's a whole other mystery now. Yeah, not even a cool montage too. No. There's a montage of going through filing cabinets? Yeah. Damn. Yeah, like a well-lit one too, not even like dramatic. Yeah, no dramatic lighting. It's no shadows, literally just well-filled. Just a mm. well-lit filing cabinet back room dang like a scene out of spider-man far from home just mm. no way home even it's no, just no way there's no way home anyway that has been the doodler case if if anybody in the task force out there does have information i've provided you the way to get in contact with the sfpd i'd be very interested to know if uh if you have information um you frustrate me trevor well hey I all didn't of do you this all of you in this room you frustrate you, you me. You need to talk to the SFPD in the 1970s. That's, That's who right. you need to at. Oh, I need to talk to Christian as to why he's having a smirk on his face. Christian, why are you smirking? This man is sapping my life force. I think I know why he's smirking. Because of the frustration that I'm feeling right now. He knows. He knows we're under attack. We're under a review attack by one of our sister podcasts. That's what I heard. I mm -hmm. heard Jam Face is coming. <laughs> yeah. Don't even say their name for right. us. Don't give them that. Don't even, don't even say it right. The jammers apparently are trying Damn. to rise up and they heard the good news about our challenge reviews, dude. Our reviews. Yeah. Right? They Last heard, we time, were top reviewed in numbers top and, and average reviewed. We were, Trevor said we were top reviewed. And I said, that's awesome. Bad news. The higher up said if we don't get 30 five star ratings by the end of the week, you're shutting down the task force. Guess what? Task Force still alive. Thank you guys. Thank those you. Five star reviews. But now, the Space Jammers, whatever the hell you, their names are, yeah. are challenging our supremacy. We got Michael and Jordan on, and the, on the team here. Spotify reviews. This is ridiculous. Spotify specifically, they're yeah. coming for our Spotify reviews for some reason. And you know what, Jamface? He's got them on the phone. He, they don't. Oh, whoa. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Did this the Red Web Task Force is ready, <laughs> How baby. you have that? Don't you dare challenge us <laughs> How in the arena of reviews. So How did he have that on his phone right. already? I'm ready. Do you think the task force ain't strapped? Huh? I thought this man unlatched huh? a drawer. You I thought dare, he was calling you someone. Dare <laughs> challenge, you dare challenge us with your greasy reviews? <laughs> Damn. Not today. It's a fight between task force and the jammers, dude. Our high rating on Spotify will reign supreme. As long as the task force comes out in droves. <laughs> the, ta the task force is there. Oh, they're, 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 Everyone the hive right mind now, is ready. They're, that's listening. Uh -huh. All right. You have a group of, I can hear them typing away. VIPs, a group of VIPs in the task force right now that are just like, yeah, I already gave my review. And then the ones that aren't, the ones that have it, Playing in the backyard as they're grilling. You know what they're doing right now? Sizzling and flipping those burgers, dude. Hell making no. sure they're well done. The burgers are being burnt. Why? Because they're going, oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. They're running away. Where they go? The task force needs me. <laughs> kids, get out the way. Boom. Shoves their Boom. kids. Uh. <laughs> Onto the floor, Dude, what we jumps need? on the computer. Spotify.com slash the red web pod. pod. <laughs> Review. <laughs> Five stars. <laughs> Die, Space Jammers. <laughs> <laughs> We've survived another day, Task Force. <laughs> Meanwhile, his smoke alarm's going off because his beep, 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 fuming beep, 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 fire beep, beep, in the backyard. Dude, task Force members across the nation. <laughs> 
<laughs> First of all, task force, I got to be honest, we need to work on our cardio a little bit. Okay? I don't, oh, no, it's not this man ran upstairs cardio. and he sounds no, like he ran a marathon. No, no way. I'm just saying the sense of urgency. You know what I'm saying? I'm not saying the sense of lack of cardio. I'm just, all I'm saying is just the urgency. Hey, Christian, they need me. Hey, just make sure that the jammers know it. Type exasperated like that, too. Just like, let me hear those breaths in your typing. <laughs> yeah, in you the know? reviews. <sighs> Five stars. I've only found out. Ten. I've only just found out. I've only just found out. Oh my god. Oh, oh. <laughs> we got a full on jam versus web pod. We got, wait. Hold on. Hold on. Let me walk it back. We got a full on jam versus web war. Yes. The pod wars are on. The pod wars. Damn. Anyway, thank you all for listening. Truly, though, the reviews really do help us out. I mean, in an algorithmic world, that is the number one way to help boost us into the eyes of, of many other future task force members. You can share us. It's another way to do it. But reviews help the podcast out a lot. Thank you for keeping up, keeping us up top. It really does mean a lot. But the war is truly on. We're coming for you. Face Jam. They had a long and impassioned speech. Ours is a lot more threatening. I think it's because we're on the heels of a true crime episode. Yeah. But, but you know what? Click them and clack them. Get out of here. <laughs> it just sounds like you're like latching a door, dude. That, d- that does not sound threatening. It sounds like a Nerf gun. It sounds like you just pulled back on a plastic sheriff's gun, you that's know? What like, I want them, that's what I want them to think. <laughs> Unthreatening, but really, I'm strapped. It comes through so clean on the audio. Yeah, it does. <laughs> Look, just task force. He's he is task cuddling the mic right now. Task force. It's just just you and me right now in this moment. There's no Christian. There's no Trevor. But if you can take just a second out of your time to drop the weight in the beaker, take off the lab coat, sit down in your velvet chair, your easy bull recliner that's been assigned to you, your desk, your computer with five. 4K, 3,060 hertz monitors, and leave that sultry five-star review. I'd love you forever. <laughs> all right, we're back. Hey, I'm sorry about that, but thank you all. Um, anyway. I don't know what happened. <clears throat> Fredo, I'll see you right back here next Monday for another mystery, <laughs> but Task Force, again, thank you for turning out, keeping us above the those... Uh, d- those <laughs> paranoid jammers. <laughs>